Hi friends, this is Manoj Prabhakar from Smart Leaders IAS. In this video, uh, we are going to have a look into the articles that were uh, that appeared on uh, third week of January in uh, the Hindu newspaper. The first article we are going to discuss is the People Connection Young Israelis in India. What is this article speaking about? This article is about uh, need for improving cultural interaction between India. It also mentions the existing cultural relationship between India and Israel. So now we have uh, improved our ties with Israel, uh, basically in the fronts of defense, also in the areas of technology transfer, especially in agriculture and uh, water technology. Apart from that, the improving cultural interaction, improving cultural interaction will strengthen the ties between any two countries. So Israel wants to improve cultural interaction between India. They want to improve the ties from trade based to service based by improving tourism and other cultural interaction between uh, two countries. And uh, there is one particular term uh, they have discussed in this article that is Aliyah. Aliyah is a right of any Jew to ascend to Israel. So we all know Israel was uh, basically a state created for the sake of Jews. So right was given to every Jew present in the you know, settled down in Israel whenever they wanted. So uh, many of the Indian Jews, they settled down in Israel uh, through the Aliyah. So the cultural relationship attains importance in the present context of India-Israel relationship. Many of the Indian Jews reached Israel through Aliyah and uh, even uh, before this uh, phase of improving cultural interaction between India and Israel, there existed some sort of relationship between, uh, relationship between India and Israel during uh, earlier period, that is during early 50s, 60s. And a street in Tel Aviv is named after our India's own Nobel laureate poet, Ravindranath Tagore. And uh, there is also another hospice of Indian Sufi saint, Baba Farid, in Al-Aqsa Mosque, Jerusalem. So whenever a Sufi saint is visiting a sacred place, they set up their hospice or a place where the, where the pilgrims can rest, where the pilgrims can stay. So our Indian uh, Sufi saint, Gandhishakar Baba Farid, has set up an hospice in Al-Aqsa Mosque, Jerusalem. As we discussed earlier, Israel is a state comprising uh, Jews from different parts of the world and uh, the non-white, non-white North African and uh, West Asian Jews are known by a term called Misrahi. Okay? And uh, there are around 80,000 Indian Jews in Israel and the Indian Jews are commonly classified along with the Misrahi community. The Indian Jews mainly Kutsin, uh, mainly uh, Kutsin Jews and Beni Israel. The Kutsin Jews, as the name suggests, they were from Kerala and uh, Beni Israel, uh, they were belong, they belong to the Konkan region of the western coast of India. They settled in Israel during early 1940s and 50s. Uh, the picture shown in this slide, uh, it shows the uh, a street called Jew Street in Kutsin. Now it is, uh, in, most of the houses are inhabited and it's a place for uh, tourist interest. It's a it has become a place of tourist interest, the Jew Street in Cochin. Since uh, people belonging to different ethnic and different uh, race groups, they settled down in Israel. Uh, just because uh, they were all Jews, there was also some uh, discrimination between the white Jews and the non-white Jews. The European white Jews are known as Ashkenazi Jews. And uh, the non-white North African, West Asian, Indian Jews are known as Misrahi. M-I-Z-R-A-H-I, Mizrahi. And these Mizrahis were uh, discriminated by Ashkenazi Jews. They were discriminated by Ashkenazi Jews. What did these Indian Jews who settled down in Israel uh, did for their uh, livelihood? The Cochin Jews, they undertake, uh, they settled in uh, Moshavs or they uh, settled down in Moshavs or community farms and they undertook uh, uh, floriculture. The Bene Jews from Konkan region, they were into some modest professions. They slowly raised into some middle income group and they got uh, settled in uh, towns like uh, Ashdod and Ramla. Also, these uh, Bene Jews fought against uh, discrimination and uh, they, uh, they were accepted, they won a major case. They, they won a legal battle by which they were accepted as full Jews. Apart from these uh, Beni Israelis and uh, Cochin Jews, there were also some other uh, Jew community in India. They, they were the Baghdadi Jews. The Baghdadi Jews were predominantly from uh, Mumbai, Calcutta and Pune. They, when they settled in Israel, they mingled with the Iraqi Jews who had come from Iraq and uh, either they, they mingled with Iraqi Jews or they mingled with the English speaking uh, Jewish immigrants. And the last chunk of uh, Indian Jews 
who settled uh, who used the root of alia to reach israel they were nei menashe jews nei menashe jews from manipur and mizoram so this picture in the slide uh, depicts the nei menashe entering uh, israel through the root of alia and now these uh, indian jews in israel they act as a bridge for cultural interaction and the author says that they celebrate indian independence day and republic day with uh, huge fervor and uh, the author is also saying that the beni beni israelis the people from konkan region <coughs> they are listening to indian music they are watching indian movies as well and uh, honorable prime minister modi visited israel uh, during in uh, 2017 uh, the indian jews were felicitated as a part of commemorating 25th year of uh, diplomatic relations and uh, prime minister netanyahu of israel he called the indian diaspora as a human bridge of uh, cultural interaction we all know that india and israel have strengthened their ties in uh, trade be it uh, defense trade or uh, transport technology transfer in the fields of agriculture or water uh, water desalination apart from this there should be some uh, people to people interaction which will strengthen the ties now both the countries are looking forward to improve the people to people interaction so the author suggests that man to man that is people to people relationship is the best way forward in building india state relationship in the next editorial which we are going to have a discussion appeared on uh, 15th of january the editorial is titled <coughs> tackling government litigation what is this article discussing about this article discusses about the large chunk of government litigation uh, pending in courts so uh, what is the present status of uh, pending cases in indian courts uh, in a report released by supreme court supreme court normally releases their annual report in which uh, they mention data pertinent to judicial activities undertaken in that particular year the report is known as indian judiciary annual report uh, the report of year 2015-16 says that more than 2.8 crore cases are pending between the district courts alone this supreme court report has also recommended for manifold increase in the number of judges in order to dispense these pending cases manifold increase in judges the author has mentioned that the government departments they are party in 46 percentage of the cases filed in the country so what does a term litigant mean litigant uh, means a party or party involved in a case the party either may be a petitioner or either may be a respondent in a case to be in more legal terms it, he may either be a complainant or a plaintiff so either of the petitioner or respondent is known as litigant what does the term government uh, mean to a common person any layman sees from a local panchayat to prime minister's office as a part of government but the extent of government or the, or the extent of the state defined by constitution in article 12 is uh, wider the constitution uh, views the term state in a wider perspective it involves even any uh, public organization or even involves even any public co corporation like ongc idbi lic so uh, it is multi dimensional uh, the government is taking myriad forms and in order to tackle the litigation which is also multi dimensional problem we should uh, work out for a multi dimensional solution to uh, curtail the litigation being uh, filed from the sides of uh, government and its agencies Uh, as we discussed earlier a government is the uh, largest litigant in the country it doesn't mean government initiates the litigation this uh, common mi misconception has uh, led to the policies which attempts to address issues of government being a compulsive litigant uh, the uh, policies undertaken by government they are uh, based on the common misconception that government is being a compulsive litigant this approach excludes the cases where the government is a respondent so when government is government is a respondent who will be the petitioner the petitioner will be the citizen and uh, a report by vidhi center for legal policy a think tank working in uh, uh, judiciary arena they say that around uh, only 7.4 only 7.4 percentage of press litigations filed by central government in 2014 the legal policy think tank they have uh, found that only 7.4 percentage of the cases that were filed in supreme court uh, during the year 2014 uh, were filed by uh, central government in order to have a proper understanding about the government uh, the manners of government litigation uh, this vidhi center of legal policy had undertaken a case study in uh, karnataka high court what are the findings of the case study um, normally it is found that uh, more than 80 percentage of the cases 
that is filed during the year to 2012 to 2016 were mainly writ against state and para state agencies. So, what are para state? We know what the state agencies that is government, what are para state agencies? Uh, para state agencies or uh, organs or agencies under the state government. And we all know Article 226 has enabled the citizen to move high court for violation of his or her uh, fundamental rights. And uh, they say that uh, the report also have found that more than 60% of the cases in uh, filed in 2016 were writ petitions. This increasing number of writ petitions shows the rising friction between the uh, government and the citizens. The number of writs indicate the extent of friction between the, govern, uh, the government and the governed. Also, uh, the author, is, uh, author has suggested possible solutions. Um, as we discussed earlier, government and this, the state and its organs take myriad forms, and you know, and uh, these government litigation has become uh, evolved as a multidimensional problem. And in order to solve this multidimensional problem, we need a multi-pronged approach to tackle the issue of government litigation. Apart from these uh, petitions filed by citizens, there is also a good chunk of cases filed because of uh, departmental and interdepartmental uh, issues, like uh, something related to promotion, something related to uh, increment, those kind of departmental related issues. And uh, the author has uh, proposed for an internal dispute resolution mechanism. That is a robust internal dispute resolution mechanism is necessary in order to solve the uh, friction happening within the government, that is the departmental and interdepartmental frictions. Also, a good number of writ petitions, a good number of cases uh, for which the government was responded were mainly on uh, the actions of the government or the quasi-judicial bodies in the cases of land acquisition. And in the cases of land acquisition, there was a clear breach of law or violation of natural justice. The author feels that since uh, the quasi-judicial officers or the main source of uh, rising litigation, he wants the uh, he wants the quasi-judicial officers to be trained in basics of uh, legal principles. So he has suggested proper training for quasi-judicial officers, and he has also proposed he has also uh, recommended for uh, creating a separate class of judicial officers, that is separate class of judicial officers to discharge quasi-judicial function so that the efficiency, uh, efficiency of the uh, quasi-judicial bodies uh, will be increased and there will be a significant number of decrease in government litigation. What is the way forward? Uh, the way forward would be like creating a broad policy like national litigation policy which was introduced in 2010 by uh, Mr. Uh, Veerappa Moili, the then Minister of Law and Justice in UPA2 government. So w w what did the moral litigation policy speak about? the model litigation policy wanted the government to be a model litigant and also policy also had some provisions for implementable action plan repeat it also had provisions for implementable action plan to ensure that the citizen does not file case against state that is by improving service quality of the state the citizens can be stopped from filing cases against the state there are certain government departments which are prone to litigations so the government has to uh, uh, government has to look into these uh, departments and they should go for specific solution for specific department uh, rather uh, the government should go for horses for uh, courses thank you